This is not an official podcast of the National Society Daughters of the American Revolution, NSDAR, and does not necessarily represent the position of the NSDAR. This interview is being conducted for the Daughter Dialogues Oral History Project. The interviewer is Risha Rainey. The narrator is Bianca Alexander. Bianca, please tell me where you were born. I was born in Garfield Heights, Ohio. Your parents, where are they from? My mother is from Cleveland, Ohio, and my father is from Cleveland, Ohio. And when were you born there? How old are you? I just turned 42. What are some of your best or most memorable childhood memories growing up? I enjoyed going to, into the kitchen and seeing my father cook, my mom cook in the kitchen. There's a small area in the kitchen uh, where you can look through the kitchen into where the living room is at. And we pretty much had TVs in every room except for the kitchen and the dining room, which we never dined in. We had a bunch of plants there and some furniture and an etage with family pictures. But in the kitchen, there was an area where there's a vent and I sit on that vent and just get warmed up from the heat that would come in the winter time and the floor was cold. So I'd sit there and just watch, you know, my dad peel potatoes or my mom cook things in the kitchen. So that was always nice. Sometimes they put on music. So eating in the kitchen, watching the prepare meals was just always a warm and fuzzy moment for me. In addition to that, I loved playing with my two older brothers. They are my half brothers, Christopher and Ricky. And it was just always cool to play with their Tonka trucks and their G.I. Joe figurines. And I put my Barbie dolls and my Cabbage Patch dolls in their Tonka trucks and just kind of ride them around, if not in the kitchen, in my bedroom. Did you grow up in Garfield Heights or was this somewhere else? We grew up in Bedford Heights, Ohio. My parents divorced in the 80s, and so my sister Blair and I moved with my mother to live with my maternal grandmother in Cleveland, Ohio. Did you still maintain contact with your father? Yes. So it was almost as if nothing changed except for that we all weren't living in the same household. So essentially almost every weekend, every other weekend, we were always spending time with my dad, my sister Blair and I, and of course my brothers were living with my father, my two half brothers. Uh, Their moms gave my dad, you know, custodial rights. Your parents, tell me more about their careers and what they did. You know, it's funny because my mother would sew the inside of the seats where you sit in the car on those beautiful plush seats, whether they're leather or some other material. You know, prior to that, she was at Ohio State University and she wanted to get into pharmacy. She didn't finish because my maternal grandfather broke his neck. So she came up to Cleveland and she ended up applying for a job with General Motors. And so she ended up working for the Fisher Body Euclid plant. Later, as her career evolved, she ended up at the Parma plant and even the Lordstown plant, uh, making sure that the machines were processing parts properly for the automobiles. Now, in terms of my father, Ricky, I've always known him to be in a superintendent or rather foreman position at LTV Steel. So one of the things that he would do is supervise, making sure that the slabs that would go through the furnace to make steel, steel slabs for automobiles and government vehicles, et cetera. He was telling me that they make sure that the workers are safe, that we're following OSHA guidelines so that people don't get killed or burned up, you know, from these long slabs that were steel, essentially, that were being, you know, forged in these fires. Tell me about school, elementary school, moving up through high school. What were your experiences? In my family, at least my father's family, they grew up Catholic, specifically Roman Catholic. And he never knew his birth father growing up as a child. He only knew his mother's side of the story. And my grandmother on my paternal side is from Cloutierville, Louisiana. And she's always identified as a Creole woman. And so for my father, he kept with that tradition and embracing his Catholic heritage So they sent me to St. Pius X. 
I also attended Christ the Nazarene Church, which was just across the street in walking distance from St. Pius X. So every Sunday we go to church together and most of my friends were, well, actually all of my friends were white. And so for a long time, I thought I was a white girl because I didn't know really what black was. My parents didn't really talk about black. They weren't Afrocentric in any way. My neighbors were Italian in the community. But it was so cute because we all dressed alike. We had our plaid uniforms and our yellow shirts underneath our uniforms. We wore our hair the same way. Of course, my hair didn't lay the way their hair laid, but these were my closest friends. So it was devastating for me when my parents divorced. Moving from the suburbs and having all white friends that went to Catholic school that understood the sacraments and then moving to my grandmother Josephine's home to stay with my, my two first cousins and my grandmother who's from another area of the south and adjusting to a new school in the inner city of Cleveland. It was called Henry W. Longfellow School. It was a major culture shock. There were students that smoked cigarettes, and this was my third grade year of school. I learned how to stick up my middle finger because that was a way of saying, hey, you messed with me. This is the explicative. So it was really challenging, but my two older cousins, specifically my one older cousin, they were sisters. The older cousin, um, she beat up anybody that would mess with me, but I learned a lot about how to survive being in a school where a lot of those youngsters didn't have a mom and a dad in the household, and maybe their parents were never married. So it was an adjustment. That's when I, I think I began to really understand that I kind of lived in a very sheltered home, even though my parents may have been going through something. That's when I realized that my life wasn't so perfect, um, but I was given so many great things at home that other students in the inner city did not have. My mother moved us back to the suburbs. We moved to University Heights, Ohio, and we stayed on a street called Farland in University Heights. And it is a public school in the suburbs. It was nice. Uh, we never went back to Catholic school and I was the only one out of all of my siblings that went to Catholic school. Even my half siblings did not go to Catholic school. But it wasn't until I got to middle school that my friendship circle began to shift. I began to notice that a lot of the, the Caucasian or white friends that I had began to spend more time with their white friends. Whereas in elementary school, we were all so close. We were selling pencils and erasers. We were like young entrepreneurs, just good friends. I mean, the Babysitter's Club. And I used to listen to Debbie Gibson. And we used to watch all of the Molly Ringwald movies, Pretty in Pink, you know, 16 Candles. But once we got to middle school, it shifted. After your elementary and high school experiences, did you go on to college? Yes, I ended up graduating from yet another uh, school district, Shaker Heights High School in the suburbs, and I ended up applying to the University of Akron, which just happens to be my father's alma mater, and I really wasn't sure what I wanted to do, but I knew that when I was a little girl, I tried to teach my dolls, my Cabbage Patch dolls. And I remember the most joyous aspect of my life that really truly inspired me were to, to become a teacher were two things. I remember going to Florida and going to Disneyland or Disney World as a little girl. And this was prior to my parents divorcing. And I heard the song, It's a Small World After All. And I remember just listening to the lyrics saying, oh my gosh. There are so many places that I want to explore someday. How am I going to do that? What am I going to be when I grow up? Fast forward to the future. I ended up going to the University of Akron. I ended up studying to be a teacher. And I remember when I took one of my certification exams, there was a question about a constructive response that you have to write about what inspired you to get into K-12 education. And that other second experience that really 
solidified it for me. It was the Bill Cosby show and how Claire Huxtable and Heathcliff, one being a doctor, one being an attorney, I said, wow, I don't know any black families that I can reference in my childhood all the way up through high school that I can say were doctors or lawyers or were in some sort of profession like engineering. No one. And I said, I want to be like that family someday. It wasn't until I heard about the story Flat Stanley where I truly realized that the world is very much so small, but all it takes is courage and faith. And if you believe you can accomplish anything, so when I became a teacher, I was going to use that profession to take me literally around the world. How did you envision that teaching was going to take you around the world? I connected with a man and he was over the Department of uh, Overseas Schools with the U.S. Department of State. And I just reached out to him. I said, my name is Bianca Alexander and I'm thinking about teaching abroad. And he said, well... What made you call me? I said, well, I just started Googling information and it was a slow day at work. And I said, I'm going to take a chance and call this man. And so I called you. He talked to me about connecting me with the international recruitment organizations. I ended up interviewing for a school in Morocco, um, a school in Papua New Guinea, and another school called Global Paradigm School in Egypt. That led to me ending up interviewing with a black man, and he hired me on the spot for a position with the American International School of Jeddah and Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. When you went to study secondary education at the University of Akron, you did so because you wanted to travel the world. But how could you have possibly known that uh, learning about K-12 through education would lead to an opportunity like this? I knew about the International Baccalaureate Program and how that is meant to be a global program. And they wanted to develop the minds of students where they look outside of their local community and explore other cultures. So I knew that that was an aspect of K-12 education and that some schools in the U.S. and abroad actually integrated the International Baccalaureate Program. And one of the things that I had to do if I wanted to become fluent as a French teacher, because that's what I studied, I studied to, to become was a secondary ed French teacher at the high school level is, you know, a study abroad. And so I, I did have to go ahead and do a study abroad independent study is what they called it in Favre's France. So when I was in Favre's France and I noticed that there were other Americans, I was the only black female at the time that was part of that cohort. And for me, going abroad and finding out that there were other people teaching abroad who were from the U.S. or from the U.K. or Canada, I said, oh my gosh, I can do this too. So I knew that there were possibilities. I just didn't know how to get there. For a long time, I struggled to figure out how am I going to pay off my student loans? What's going to be the next step for me? Who's going to help me? So with a lot of prayer, a lot of faith, and just kind of taking a chance and calling around and Googling some things, I knew that there was an opportunity. I just didn't know when it would happen. It happened much later than what I expected. Was this before or after you went on to graduate school? After graduate school. Tell me about the graduate school and what did you study? Instructional technology. I knew that technology was something that was constantly changing, just like education changes and shifts. And I said that instructional technology piece might make me more marketable. And I ended up getting hired as a program specialist for the North Central Regional Education Laboratory in Naperville, Illinois. And I enjoyed that job because that's, that's the state that I was living in where I ended up getting hired to go work for AISJ and JETA. The work that I did there, though, was what springboarded him even being curious about me because I did work for the United States Virgin Islands schools as a program specialist. What we would do is take a look at schools that were trying to meet AYP, adequate yearly progress. So a lot of the schools on the south side of Chicago and even the west side, Humboldt Park, where a lot of the Puerto Ricans and Hispanics live, 
unfortunately, those schools, those teachers, for whatever reason, were struggling to be to meet the academic and social emotional needs of their students and the families. Uh, if you have a community school, you have to make sure that you're servicing the community. So it's not just the child, it's also the families. Are you providing GED programs? Do you have robust Head Start programs? So a lot of the work that I did as a program specialist was like the paperwork for the senior uh, program managers. I didn't think I'd go back into the classroom. I knew that I still wanted that. I had that international bug. I was bitten already. So once the work that I was doing ended, I ended up going to Florida. <laughs> it wasn't until the second time that I moved back to um, the western Chicago suburbs and I worked in a very tough school district and I worked in a school with lots of uh, gang influence. It was across from a cemetery that had a lot of former people uh, in the mafia were buried there. It was just a very controversial area. Chicago has a rich history, but I worked there because I knew that I had the skills to help a lot of the young people be successful. And at the time, coincidentally, before I ended up getting the offer to go abroad to Saudi Arabia after my school year contract ended, I remember doing a lot of work as a volunteer for the Urban League Young Professionals of Chicago. And that's how I connected with other young black professionals. Uh, but also in the midst of that, there was someone that was an officer with the Urban League Young Professionals in Chicago. And she was soliciting volunteers for her job to come and speak to the Boys and Girls Club students. And she asked me to come and speak and not realizing that I'm not Hispanic, I was asked to come and speak to the Latina young girls and the Latino boys. <laughs> I wasn't asked, you know, to speak to the African American students at a forum. So one part that people don't know about me is that I did not get good grades in high school. I purposefully did not apply myself hoping that my parents would get back together, you know? I wasn't part of Jack and Jill in high school, so I didn't, I didn't get an invite to the Cotillions because I wasn't part of those families that were in Jack and Jill uh, in high school who had a mom and dad that showed up to all the events because my parents had been divorced. So for me, that was tough because I couldn't fit in with the crowd that I wanted to be a part of. And I felt like I had something special to offer the young ladies in that group. We shared the same interests. We just weren't part of the same social class. And so I remember just thinking to myself, I'm going to show these young Latino students my old report card and show them all that I've accomplished up to this point in my life at the time and explain to them that they too can leave one aspect of their life, their childhood that may not have been positive due to familial experiences that were not nurturing, that may have been negative, and they can turn those negative experiences into learning experiences. They don't have to carry that baggage from their background into their future. And so as I was speaking to them, I showed them a report card. I whited out my name and made a copy of it. And I said, what can you tell me about this person's life based on their report card from high school? And of course, you know, they were probably thinking, man, this person probably was a bad student. They probably had a troubled life. And it wasn't until at the end, I explained that the person who actually this report card represents as me. It was it's still awkward to even talk about it because to be as intelligent and to be agile and able to be successful, I purposefully did not apply myself because I was so angry that my parents never fully reconciled from their divorce. And I felt like it hindered me from being able to connect with people the way that I'm able to connect now and the way that I was prior to them divorcing. You also received a Master of Science in Education Law. Was that before you went to Saudi Arabia? That was also, yes, before I went to Saudi Arabia. I was an academic at heart. So getting into school law was helping me to understand how to protect the rights of those special needs students. Early on in my career, I noticed that 
students who were in my French classes, well, they didn't know what a direct object was. They didn't know what an adverb was. And I said, how is it they placed special needs students in an elective course because they had to have a foreign language to graduate from high school, but yet they were struggling in a normal, regular English language arts course? I said, this is crazy. It makes no sense. And I remember going into hearings and IEP meetings and determination meetings for special needs students that were labeled as SLD, specific learning disabled. And I said to myself, there's no one really protecting these students. And there was a disproportionate number of black males being placed in special ed. So getting into school law, getting that degree was very important because then I knew how to speak Thoughtfully, I understood a lot of the rights that special needs students had, but I also got an understanding of how to deal with students who may have been disproportionately suspended or even expelled, and maybe they didn't get the due process that they needed. Who would have thought I'd be dealing with school law right now, working for the U.S. Bureau of Indian Education, working for Indians and supporting their rights to an education? Who would have thought about that? Tell me about your journey to that job that you have now, starting in Saudi Arabia. Where did you go from Saudi Arabia through to working and advocating for the rights that you are now with American Indians? When I went to Saudi Arabia and I was going to be a resource teacher for students who had special needs. And so instead of saying special ed teacher, it was special. It was a resource teacher because in the Arab Gulf, working with these wealthy families who are attending this private school, AISJ, it is taboo to even mention that a child who may be a descendant of the king. Remember, Saudi Arabia is a kingdom. <laughs> in a lot of these wealthy families, they don't want to be associated with anything that's special needs. But I was really curious to learn about how other educational systems worked. I wanted to know what is different about how we teach in the U.S. compared to other places abroad. I knew that it was going to be a journey. I knew that I was going to have to also tone down my ability to advocate for women in a way where I had to respect the cultural norms of Saudi Arabia, not just simply as a guest in the country, but even as a teacher, because even though I was at an American international school that had a partnership with Raytheon, Caterpillar, IBM, I still had to understand I'm an American as a guest and even as a female who's very vocal, who knows who she is, in order to survive the next two years in Saudi Arabia, I'd have to be covered outside of the compound where I lived, which was the Saudi Airlines compound. I'd also have to turn down my voice when I went on to campus, which was fully barbed wired because there were other people from the Middle East, specifically Lebanon, Jordan, Palestine, as they called it. And those women understood their place within their culture, whereas I did not. So those two years in Saudi Arabia working with children who had special needs, but in a resource classroom capacity, allowed me to understand how, no matter how wealthy you are, you still have the same issues that a family without much has, competing with those who are different, classism, women and, and young young girls not having the same access to education in the same capacity as males. Women being trained and taught that someday, depending on how much schooling your family wants you to have, you're going to end up keeping house, cooking for your family, having as many babies as possible before a certain age. So not only did I learn a lot about what it means to be a female in that culture over in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, I also began to realize that, hey, I can go anywhere and I can assimilate very easily. And it was also there that I discovered that Americans have issues with color. Because over there, when I'd say I'm black, 
when they'd ask me, are you Egyptian? Are you Jamaican? Are you from the UK and you have African parents? They never associated me with being American because when they thought of American with some of the wealthy families, they were thinking of maybe a blonde or white female. I remember right around the time that I finished out my two-year contract in Saudi Arabia, I, I was being treated very special by several of the wealthy families. If you research any of those families, they are extremely wealthy. And I'm not talking rich, I'm talking wealthy. I remember saying, I'm going to leave some of these families and they have welcomed me in as if I'm part of their own. Well, when I came back to America, I ended up getting a position at a charter school and it was uh, on the west side of Cleveland, another rough area. And I didn't like it. I didn't like it at all. I just kept seeing the same pervasive problems, school after school. And I remember saying to myself, I need to get into administration. I need to study to become a school leader. I don't know if I necessarily want to be a principal. Maybe I'll be a vice principal. But I ended up enrolling in Ursuline College to get the credentialing to become a licensed teacher and sit for the state exams for the state of Ohio to be a school principal. And I did it. I was successful at doing it. And so in the midst of finishing up that program, I ended up, Risha, getting a phone call from an administrator, a superintendent, who was a director of a school in Egypt, who was asked to actually go and be a director of a school in Kuwait, the embassy state of Kuwait. So he said, I'd like to hire you to be the lower school principal at a GIL school in Kuwait. He hired me. I ended up going abroad to Kuwait and he hired me at one school, but there was a woman that was part of a sorority, Delta Sigma Theta. I had went to a dinner party essentially and they were all African-American women who had been working in Kuwait, all administrators. I said, whoa, this is amazing. And the woman who hosted this dinner party was an AKA, and I'm a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. But this woman who was part of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated just happened to be at this dinner party. And I knew that it was not going to work out at that first school at AGIL in Kuwait. And they knew that it was not working out either. It's a small circle. And I was going to end up coming back home to Ohio. Well, she said, Bianca, would you like to come to my school, KBS, Kuwait Bilingual School, and be my international baccalaureate curriculum teacher? And I shifted immediately into that leadership role at that school. Not even a month later, the director of the school, they asked me, do you want to be the principal of our sister school? It is an all-girls school in Kuwait. I said, are you serious? She said, Bianca, I've always wanted you to go back into your admin role. It's just that you're going to a different school position in a more conservative area of Kuwait. And you had to prove yourself with not just me and my director, but also with these families out here. So I ended, I ended up becoming the principal of Kuwait Bilingual School. And actually, I was the director. I'd say almost toward the end of my year-long contract, I had decided that it was time for me to head back home. I began to get very lonesome. Fast forward to the future, I ended up um, getting a position at a charter school in Columbus, Ohio, and I didn't like that either. I said, man, these charter schools are taking advantage of these families. They're not, they're not hiring people who come from tried and true programs. They are not equipping these young teachers who don't look like these kids to be able to go into the inner city and meet these children where they're at. They need to understand families that come from poverty. So I said, I'm not staying here after my contract ends. I've moved around so much and I've gained all this experience. I need to have my own school. And I had always been kind of fearful of leading a school in the US because I knew that there were going to be more restrictions, more guidelines, more procedures, more legal ease that I needed to understand. Well, May the 30th of this year, 2020, 
just in the midst of most schools closing due to COVID-19 pandemic concerns, I ended up getting an offer to work on behalf of Indian Americans with the Bureau of Indian Education as the principal of Baca Deloy Ozzy Community School in Pruitt, New Mexico. I'd like to go back to talk about your understanding of your own racial identity. You said that growing up, you didn't know that you were Black. How did your mother identify racially? My mother identifies as American. I've never heard her refer to herself as Black. Even on census records, she just chooses to prefer to mark other. And if there was just a plain American spot, that's what she would choose. And how do you see her when you look at her? Do you feel like other people view her as Black? How did other people perceive her? Well, I can tell you from my father's family, they probably would have wanted my mom to be white or another fellow Creole or another fair-skinned Black woman. So when my dad married my mom, of course, they, my, my dad's Creole family identified my mother as Black. And I know her family members, several of them, choose to identify as Black. I think for my mother, she doesn't, there's still some residue from her aunts and uncles that grew up in the South, in North Carolina, in Virginia, and Alabama, where there's a lot of stereotypes of Black people, especially from the South. Did you do a lot of research or any research on her side of the family? I have done research on her side of the family. She never knew her maternal grandmother, but she knew quite a bit about her paternal family. And she comes from a long line of Baptist ministers from Alabama. Were they black, white, or other? They definitely identified as blacks from the South. Let's talk about your father and how he understood his ethnicity and his mother's ethnicity. My dad, before he was born, had his eldest brother, who was born to a different male, his elder sister, who was born to a different male, and then my dad was born. So here it is. He had two half-siblings who were fair-skinned, who clearly did not look if you saw them on the outside, people would identify them as maybe being something other than black, especially his sister. And they had different fathers from him. My father never knew his birth father growing up. He was raised by my grandmother, his mom, but he was also raised by a man that I call Bubba. Bubba. He took my grandmother in and he took her in because he fell in love with her. But he had already had children by someone else. And I think it was a situation where my grandmother's two uncles who had a lot of influence down in Cloutierville, Louisiana, they left. They took up with black women. They didn't marry Creole women when they came to Cleveland. And they didn't marry white women. They took up with black women, which was highly unusual. So the story behind that or the myth behind that was is that when my grandmother came up here, they sent her up here, but her siblings all went out to California, all of her blood siblings, because my grandmother would hang out with black people when she was in Louisiana. And that was considered taboo. If you were Creole, preferably, yes, you attended the Catholic Church, you sent your children to Catholic school, you married either white or other fair-skinned Creoles who fared well, who ended up going to school and getting an education and went into, I, I call them sexy professions, those professions that everybody glean at and say, oh my gosh, that's amazing. Whereas my grandmother, she came up, she came up to Cleveland. Her two uncles became window washers in Cleveland. They never returned to Louisiana, neither did my grandmother. She ended up cleaning houses for Jewish families. And so my dad knew who his mother was, but he didn't really know what her race was because we were always told she's white, but in actuality, she's just a very fair-skinned woman of color whose heritage has always been Creole. 
and the man that she married was a dark well common law marriage that is the man that she was in a common law relationship with who raised my father as his own and raised uh his two biological children with my grandmother uh they were the children by Bubba and my grandmother Lucille Couty my uncle Joseph and my aunt Teresa were raised by other relatives so there was a lot of division and a lot of tears in our family. Let me tell you this. My dad said he didn't know that Bubba wasn't his father. And I said, this man is very, very dark skinned. How did you not know that he wasn't your dad? That's what I'm thinking in my mind. He said, Bianca, I didn't find out that daddy, who he affectionately calls Bubba, I didn't know that daddy wasn't my dad until I went to a little league practice and you had to have your birth certificate. Well, on the paperwork, it wasn't Bubba's name. I don't know what he went through as a young child when he discovered that this man Bubba wasn't his daddy, but he said, Bianca, that's the only daddy I knew. He loved me. In fact, he left all of his financial affairs and business to my father, not his biological children. So my dad loves black people, even though he's very fair skinned. And when he was a young man, he wanted to have an Afro that was as they call it kinky and could stand up. But my dad always had soft hair very fair skinned, green eyes like me, but he knew he couldn't fit in with the black people because he was so fair. Maybe they thought he was trying too hard. They liked him because he was cool, but also he wasn't Afrocentric. He was just Ricky Kuti Alexander, you know? When he began to look at the records for his mother, he remembered when she came up to Cleveland that she had something called the Negro Certificate. This Negro certificate was from the state of Louisiana, and it showed that she had graduated based on the number of years that she needed for schooling, and I believe it was the third grade. And on it, it lists her name as Lucy Couty, L-U-C-Y-C-O-U-T-Y. And any other records that he's had for her, he knew of her as white, but here it is, a Negro certificate from the Louisiana Department of Education showing her as a Negro. Let's back up. You said that your grandmother, Lucy, grew up as a Creole and she identified as white because mm -hmm. that's all that you and your father knew her as was white. But explain the Creole, I guess, community and cultures and how that they define themselves and how she decided to identify as white, but yet on the certificate from school, they defined her as Negro. The interesting part about the families is that my dad was never super close to any of his first cousins. And his first cousins are so fair skinned, several of them that they to this day pass as white. So we had some Creoles around family members. They identified as being people of color of Creole heritage. Some almost speak as if they use Creole as an ethnicity, whereas my dad has always looked at it as a culture. He understood his blackness. Wait, so your dad assigned himself as black, but your yes, he identified grandmother was always white. as black. Yes, but his mother had, and he, and he didn't correct my grandmother. He let her believe and speak the way she wanted to speak as being a white person coming up to Cleveland. But back at home in Clutcherville, Louisiana, in Natchitoches Parish, right around Albervale and the Cane River, she was known as a Creole. But I was always told that out of all my grandmother's siblings, she was one that looked the most African. And when I say looked the most African, having what they say are Negroid features, the thicker, fleshy nose, um, her lips were a little bit fuller. Whereas some of her siblings, they looked very much so European and could pass. Their hair was even more silkier and straight. Hers was silkier, um, but it was a lot thicker. And so I was told by other cousins over time that my grandmother was sent away with her uncles because she associated with blacks who were Creole, but who were around black people. And they did stuff that black people supposedly did, hanging out at like a, I don't think you call it a juke joint, but hanging out at the halls and dancing and those type of things. And my grandmother probably was being told that she needed to marry a white person 
in Louisiana or marry another Creole. And she was also probably told, if you're going to do what we do as your older siblings, and she had a younger sibling as well. If you're going to do what we do, then you're going to come out to California and you're going to marry either another Creole or you're going to marry a white. And my grandmother probably was in disagreement with that. I think it was probably a very big falling out. And so her uncle Albert, who had a lot of influence, and her uncle Pete, who could pass, she left with them and they moved to Cleveland and never came back. And uncle Albert abandoned his family. He had already had a wife and his wife could pass along with their children. It wasn't until I believe it was around the year of 2002 that there was a cousin. There was a cousin of my father who was a direct descendant of Albert Cuti and Evelina Cuti. So we had a lot of cousins that intermarried, first and second cousins uh, from my grandmother's generation and prior to that they married each other. They marry first and second cousins. I'm surprised there's not a lot of mental retardation because when you marry so close, they call that consanguinity, I believe it is, when you marry so close in the bloodline. Just to keep it fair, because I'm assuming they couldn't find any whites that were willing to marry them because if the whites had found out I'm marrying a black from this rural area of the South, who knows? Maybe that Creole woman would have been beat or physically abused, or maybe she would have been abandoned and their offspring. So it was just very taboo to marry a black. So when my grandmother was down there around her family, yeah, she was accepted as Creole. And maybe in all of her siblings, her sister Maclita Kuti married Oze Joseph Kuti. They call him OJ. He was darker and he very much so looked Native American, but he had straight jet black hair, dark black coal colored eyes. He married his cousin, Maclita. <laughs> they married first cousins and second cousins marrying. Her sister, Justina Cuti. Justina married Joseph Clemens Baudouin, yet another Creole who could pass for white. They call him Blue Eyes because he had blue eyes. And then also her brother, Paul, who my grandmother loved so much. And Uncle Paul Cuti married Gloria Wright. Gloria Wright is also a cousin and who's Creole. And then, of course, uh, Herzog died. He died as a young baby. Herzog was, would have been the oldest. My grandmother's brother, Herbert Cuti Jr., married Lorraine Conde, who's another Creole who's a cousin. So all, and Ernest Cuti was the only one that I know of. My grandmother's eldest brother, he married a white female and those 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 children from Ernest Coutian and the white fe female I believe her maiden name was Otwell the white female they passed for white as well in fact when I when I took the DNA test through 23andMe let me tell you how deep this is I took Ancestry and 23andMe and I found out that my dad's first cousin she passes and she never responded but she did connect with me when she saw that I connected with some of my dad's other first cousins that pass for white but the interesting part about all of this is that there is a woman who is a well-known genealogist here in the United States her name is Elizabeth Shone Mills I am related to the offspring of this well-known researcher who has researched the Cane River community all these years. And she's also the one who wrote the book with her husband, Gary B. Mills, The Forgotten People, where they talk about all of these Creole people who are descendants of these Frenchmen who had children with slaves and left land to these slaves. And these slaves bought slaves and these uh, offspring were manumitted over time. And I said, wow, Elizabeth Shomil started the research, but it was the families that passed on stories from generation to generation. Please define Creole in your words, in your understanding. My understanding is it's the food. It's our religious uh, traditions in the Roman Catholic Church. It's sending your young daughters and young sons to Catholic school. It's knowing the sacraments. It's carrying your rose, your rosary beads close by. It's the jambalaya. It's the etouffee. It's also 
the gumbo that we eat. It's everything about how we marry into other Creole families, why we do it to preserve our history, to stay connected to the land down there in Louisiana. But it's also remembering why they married other Creoles and whites. Before the Civil War, these families interacted. In fact, St. Augustine Church, along with St. John the Baptist, the Creole families that built St. Augustine, my relatives who are related to the Matuires, specifically Nicholas Augustine Matuire, who is one of the two, the, the twin offspring of Marie Therese Coin Coin, the slave, who actually had all of these children by Claude Thomas Pierre Matuire, the white Frenchman. The idea was is that you continue the bloodline so that latter generations will always remember where we come from and what we built and what we had. So Creole families tended to, in my, in my perspective, based on what my family members have done, you married Creoles, people who were mixed race, because that meant that you were ensuring that your family would have ideally better opportunities in, in terms of employment, in terms of marrying up into a higher social status, you were also expected to maintain your religious traditions. You were also expected to teach the following generation to marry into this culture. I see you didn't mention the races. What, what did it consist of, the mixed races of the Creoles? According to the census charts and the baptismal records at St. John the Baptist Church, which is where many of the offspring were sharecroppers, whereas the previous generations that were members of St. Augustine were the planters, whose forefathers were white and Spanish Frenchmen. The races that you saw were Native Americans specifically. Uh, I've seen the records for the Caddo Nation. You also had African, you also had German, you had Spanish, because at one time, Louisiana was part of Spanish America. So some of the family names at one point became Paul, became Pablo, John became Juan in some of the records. You also had French. You also had some Jews that were in Louisiana, in Louisiana even before the Civil War as well. So why was it important to marry into the Creole? I heard that you talked about because that would afford them a higher social status, but how did they even attain this status that they were concerned about maintaining? I think that the status came from their forefathers, the two twins, Suzanne Matoire and Nicholas Augustine Matoire. Being that their father was a Frenchman and their mother was a slave, and many people do believe that Marie Therese Coincoin was biracial and that her father, her paternity, might have been Mr. Saint Denis, who owned her. Remember when Claude Thomas Pierre Matoire, in the history from what it says, he actually purchased her. So Claude Thomas Pierre Matoire was certainly, uh, like many of the Frenchmen, sent to the new world to colonize you know what we now know as north america and so he came from la rochelle or la manche uh, bas normandy france when he came over he settled in natchitoches parish he had a general store he was born around 1743 but they say he arrived in louisiana in louisiana around 1755 so tell me about Claude Thomas Pierre Matoire and how he met Marie Therese Coincoin. So as the story has been told, Marie Therese was a slave of Saint Denis. And Saint Denis, you know, would send his slaves out to get supplies and different things. And at the time they had something that we call a general store. And so apparently from what I was told is that she had went to the general store, one of the stores that Claude Thomas Pierre Matoire and his p business partner had together. And he saw her come into the store and that it was an attraction, a natural attraction. I was told he was a very handsome Frenchman, but that she was also very attractive. She didn't look like 
an African from off of a slave ship. She was a house slave at that, very well put together. Uh, her, facial, her facial features did not look like a slave that had just left the continent of Africa. So it was probably intriguing to see a slave that looked like her. And they say that she did know the traditions of her African mother. I'm talking about healing through medicine, homeopathic ways. Well, he ended up purchasing her from St. Denis. Well, it turned into a placage relationship, uh, meaning that it, it turned into more than just simply her being a servant. From what I've learned about placage is that it was recognized as like an extra legal system between, you know, the French and the Spanish slave colonies. So the Spaniards and the Frenchmen and any other Europeans that had slaves, they ended up having children with these slaves and they ended up producing offspring that were obviously of African heritage, Native American heritage. They, they were creating a mixed race of people generation after generation. So it means to be placed with placage. It's like common law. Did he have a legal marriage in addition to this placage? Yes, he did. He had a legal marriage, but it was to a white woman, a Brouard woman. Her name was Mary Therese Brouard. <laughs> uh, that relationship happened many years after he had already had many children with Marie Therese Coin Coin. But I am a descendant of one of the offspring of Claude Thomas Pierre Matoire and Marie Therese Coin Coin, specifically Dominique Matoire. And I was told that Dominique had the most children out of uh, his relationship with Marie Marguerite Lecomte. And the Lecomtes are also French as well. They wanted to protect their prominence by marrying into their same community. How did the community even become prominent in the first place? Well, I found out that not only did Claude Thomas Pierre Matoire leave these children that he had with Marie Therese Coin Coin land, they had their own plantations. So Dominique Matoire, Nicholas Augustin Matoire, all of his, his children, his male sons had plantations and they also had slaves. Well, some of the slaves that Dominique had were family members. So even though they were mixed race, some of them were still slaves until they were manumitted. So it was a way of kind of protecting their family members, their relatives. They had cattle. They, they, they could sell bear grease. Bear grease could be used to uh, muskets, you know, muskets that they use to, you know, shoot and go hunting. Bear grease was, was good for lubricating, uh, lubricating weapons. In addition to having cattle, they also had sugar cane, indigo that they were growing. They were planters, just like the whites who were Europeans in the community. So they had lots of money. Marie Therese Coin Coin was left land by Claude Thomas Pierre Matoire. That classism piece uh, spilled into when you go to church on Sundays where some people paid $5, some people paid $1, some people paid a nickel or 10 cents to sit on the front pews closest to where the priest was. So that meant Nicholas Augustin, Dominic, and their siblings, they could sit in the front of the church, but the whites had to sit behind them. How do you even resolve that social norm where whites who later in society were able to take advantage of their white privilege at one point in time were sitting behind mixed race blacks and one of the local historical churches. What other oral histories did you hear from your grandmother about her time in the Creole community in the Cane River settlement? It's interesting because my grandmother really never spoke about it. How I stumbled upon learning more about my grandmother and her people was not so much from my dad because he only knew a little bit. So I just happened to one particular day, right around the time where we knew that my grandmother's mind was, was, was changing, her thoughts was changing, neurologically something was going on. I remember going into the living room of the house, uh, my grandparents' house, you know, Bubba, my grandmother, where they were living. And I went into the corner where they have what we call whatnots, little figurines made out of glass. And down below on the bottom shelf, I saw all of these photo albums. And in the photo album that I saw that had pictures of my grandmother, I noticed in those pictures, I saw these people who looked white. 
but she was hugging them. There was someone that I later found out was her nephew sitting on, she was sitting on his lap. And I said, oh my God, who are these people? So later I asked my grandmother, she said, those are my, those are my brothers and sisters. That's how she'd say it. Those are my brothers and sisters. And I said, oh, well, where are they from? Well, they're from Clutcherville. I said, where's Clutcherville? She said, Louisiana. She said, those are my people. So I said, oh my gosh. I said, well, grandmother, why don't you ever talk about these people? She said, well, no one's asked me and they all live in California now and mama died and daddy died. Everything that she, she grew up hearing about food, learning how to hunt. My grandmother, she could carry a rifle on her. They, they grew up in an area where you could eat squirrel, you could eat rabbit. You had a garlic house where they dried out the garlic and peanuts and things of that nature. So that's the part that was passed on to, to my dad. And the part that I came to know from my grandmother is that they were Creole. They were people who married other Creoles. They were not African. That's one thing she told me. We are not from Africa. She doesn't want to see anything about Africa. And so I said, oh boy, that's something that she was probably told as a child over and over by her older siblings and her parents. And so that's probably why my dad always told me, don't marry some big bubble lip. And I'm not going to say the term because we don't use it anymore in society because it's derogatory and you don't marry somebody that looks a certain way. It wasn't until later on in life that my dad accepted, look, I'm black and you marry who you want to marry. But it, there's still this underlying piece with me and some of my first cousins. We still know that our family would prefer that we marry someone where the features come out more looking European. It's really sad that that's still an underlying piece, but now... It's changed a lot. Now that my dad has retired, he's married black women. He married my, my mom. They divorced. He married my, my stepmother. And he doesn't say that as much anymore. But to this day, I know deep down inside, both my father and many of his first cousins that have daughters would prefer that we not marry somebody that had features that looked African. I also think, too, the other piece that kind of leads to stain is that many Africans sold other Africans into slavery as well. When my dad went to the university, some Africans, I can even tell you from my own experience, they don't necessarily say that they identify with black Americans because they know there's so many generations removed from the transatlantic slave piece, the slave trade that occurred. But yet still to this day, you still have Africans selling other Africans into bondage. You know, it's funny because I don't even think my grandmother, she may have heard about Marie Therese coin coin. However, I've never heard her ever say the name out of her mouth. The first time that I found out that Marie Therese coin coin was actually a slave was through talking to a cousin. And I did reveal that to my dad. I don't remember revealing that to my grandmother because I think she probably would have rejected it even in her dementia. She would not be okay with that. I remember once when I brought a fellow home, she asking me, why'd you bring that black man in the house? I think she knew Bianca is choosing her own way like me, even though I may not like it. Just like she strayed away and had children with black men, she knew that was the direction I was going to go in life too. So if she associated with Black people as a Creole, was she, you think that she was kind of ousted from the community yes. because of that? Yes. And I was told by my cousin who's in Europe now, uh, basically, if you didn't follow my grandmother's eldest sister's guidance on who to marry and and who to associate with in the community, when it did come time, you know, with the Great Migration, many Blacks moved to Chicago, Illinois, Los Angeles, California. If you didn't follow Maclita Kuti, her elder sister's guidance, or even the elders, the great uncles, etc., you were going to be ousted. You were going to be shunned by your family. People were telling me, Bianca, you know, I hate to tell you this, family members, but your grandmother was not accepted. In fact, they say she didn't go to the same school as her siblings. She went to the school where, where all the black kids went because they say of the way she looked. 
was there also a division socially as far as status? Oh, yes, because some worked for the local railroad, whereas my grandmother's parents, Herbert Cootie Sr., and then also her mother, Nora Lee, or Noli, as they affectionately call her in the Cane River community, Noli Monette, they were farmers. They didn't go to college. They didn't have the same experiences where some of those people from the Creole community in and around Clutcherville, where my grandmother was from, some of them sent their children to go to the university, whereas my grandmother's family, (laughs) nope, you were going to be a farmer. You were going to end up picking cotton, which they tell me that my grandmother was one of the younger siblings, but that her older siblings did pick cotton and that more than likely at some point in time, my grandmother did do it for a short period of time. Even though they were all related and there was some love for one another, I'm telling you right now, prior to the Civil War and after the Civil War, gradually family members became more segmented because they wanted to secure some sort of status in the community. But it it all started with those who were Creole who could pass that were still planters, who still own plantations before they were bought by white Americans. And then the others who were sharecroppers. Herbert, okay, so my grandmother and her, her, we call her Seal or Lucille, but down there she was known as Lucy Cootie. So Lucy Cootie's father was Herbert Cootie Sr. The Cooties are also from France and so are the Monettes. So Noralee Monette was her mother. Now Noralee Monette's mother was Lorraine Galleon. The, the Galleons were also from France, but they moved to what we now know, now know as uh, Quebec. Lorraine Galleon married Philibert Monette. Philibert Monette's father was Hypolite, like Hippo, Hypolite Monette. He married a Marie Adolphine Matoire. So the Monettes married into the Matoires. Lorraine Galleon, her father was Florian Galleon. Her mother was never Marie Adelaide Matoire, which I was told for years. It turns out within the last month or so of this of this year, I found out that Lorraine Galleon's father was, yes, truly Florian Galleon, but in order for me to get a supplemental for a man named Nicholas Galleon, I had to prove the parentage of Lorraine, and I couldn't find out who her true mother was. I was always told it was Marie Adelaide Adelaide Matoire by family members, even on social media. But in actuality, her mother's name was Lolite Vercher. And Lolite Vercher, which you and I would say Verche, she was a white woman. Another descendant from a French family. Which child under Dominique do you descend? So Dominique Matoire... His son was Jean-Baptiste Dominique Matoire. Jean-Baptiste Dominique Matoire had a wife. Her name was Marie Adelaide Rachel, which links me back up to Elizabeth Shaw Mills, the researcher who married Gary B. Mills, who wrote the book, The Forgotten People. And also she published the the Natchitoches Colonial Records, which is what the DAR accepts in terms of verifying those patriot ancestors that I come from, from Remy Poiseau, Claude Thomas Pierre Matoire, Julian Rachel, and Nicholas Galleon. And I have a few other supplementals as well, but those are the major ones. And when I say major, well, Remy Poiseau was part of the Royal Navy, the French Royal Navy. Jean Baptiste Brevel, who's connected to Julian Rachel. Uh, he was married to my Brevel descendant, uh, was married to Anne of the Caddos, who was part of the Caddo Nation. Nicholas Galleon, Julian Rachel, Claude Thomas Pierre Matoire, along with Remy Poiseau, all owned slaves. And they all left land to these mixed race offspring that they had. So if she decided that she wanted to hang around with black people while she was living in Louisiana as a Creole and... Creole, they don't, from what I understand, and please tell me, do they have to assign themselves to a race? What is their race? What is their racial identity as Creole? I can tell you that I was told by a cousin. I'm not going to share that person's name. But Bianca, I was always told you can choose what you want to be. 
I had never heard that. But society wants to identify with you in some way. So they use what they see on the outside to put you in a category. Whereas Creole people, especially if you could pass, passe blanc, if you could pass, you had the joy and pleasure of being able to assimilate in any culture for your own benefit. I think when it came to the point that my grandmother was at some point going to a school with quote unquote Negroes, as it is on the Louisiana Department of Education paperwork, I think she knew she was different. I think she knew that her future was already set by her elder siblings. Either you're going to do this or you're going to do that. Her siblings knew that they were no longer farming. They were no longer sharecropping. So I think they left between 42 and 45 to go to Los Angeles. She had to make a choice. If, if I'm going to be controlled or manipulated or told what to do by my elder siblings and I'm not happy with that, I got to find family members who are going to steer me in a different direction who are going to love me for who I am. So she had to choose if she was at some point in time, she chose to associate with black people. So I think that she chose because black people, people who just identified as black embraced her, even those in Louisiana, where she was, she wasn't accepted at some point in time by, I believe a few of her siblings, um, along with the, those who could pass. Why did she decide to identify as white? Is it correct that Creole people really resented having to select a ethnicity? That is true. They did resent that. But at some point in time, you got to survive. When you look at applying for a job and they want to know your demographic information and you have to check off a box, they probably checked off white. I think at some point in time, if my grandmother had to check off a box in her adolescent years and even in her high school year, well, at her adolescent years, she probably would have checked off white. As she grew older and she came into who she became, and started going to Negro schools. And we know she didn't go to high school. You know, she didn't have to have that much education. And she started to look more at the time. Blacks were called Negroes at the time. She, that's all she was around. Because her siblings went to other schools where they could fit in with whites. And even claim white heritage. Except for when they went home. They had this sister and brother who may look more black. Who may have looked more black. So I think that, yes, there was resentment. But if you went against the grain, if you went against what your parents said or some of those elder siblings who may have raised you while the parents were out and about taking care of business, you just accepted that that was your fate. I think that's what happened to my grandmother and her two uncles, although her uncles did pass even in Cleveland for, for white. However, they took up with very dark skinned black women. I think that that was like a slap in the face to the family members down there that he left, even his family that he left. He had a wife already, but left her because I think they just got fed up with trying to be something that they weren't. Did you get married? Are you married? And do you have children? I am not married. I do not have children. I was in a relationship with someone for approximately 12 years off and on. I've traveled the world. He's also traveled the world as well. And he was a very dark skinned man. I liked him because he was educated, but he was the opposite of what my family would have wanted me to even be associated with. I think that internal defiance was a way of saying that I'm going to be who I am. I'm going to love from the heart. I'm going to love based on character. Even though that relationship did not work out, I know more about who I am. I accept the fact that I am an amazing, intelligent Black woman, and I embrace Black people. Did you or your grandmother ever go back to visit your grandmother's hometown? I always knew it to be a rite of passage to go back down there. That's just something everybody did at one point in time in their life before they died. They all went down to Cloutierville, down to the Cane River in the Albreville area. And you went to go visit the old courthouses and the old churches and the cemeteries. So I went for the first time in 2018 to Magnolia Plantation, Melrose Plantation, which is where most of those uh, who identify as Creole were born and raised, and they also own that land as well. 
Why did you wait until 2018, nearly 40 years after you were born, to go back to this hometown, which you identify so closely with? It was something that I wanted to do because I knew that my grandmother had dementia. And so if I had not gone before she passed away, I felt like maybe I'd be letting her down in some sort of way. For a while, I was afraid. I was fearful that I would not be accepted when I went down there to that rural town. Did your grandmother visit her family back in her hometown or keep in touch with any of the ones that previously shunned her? She did, and it was uh, via phone call. I was always told that right around the time that her mother had died, now her mother had passed away in California, so I think that all of the siblings met together. My grandmother and her brothers and sisters met together, I think, one last time down there in the old house uh, where they grew up at in Clutcherville, Louisiana, and they took pictures together. But I think that was probably the last time that they were all alive and together. But I knew that she always kept in contact with one of her brothers who always accepted her, who also married another Creole woman, and she was very close to that brother and sister-in-law. They even came up to Cleveland to visit my father and my grandmother on more than one occasion. What was your Revolutionary War ancestor's service? So I believe he was part of the Natchitoches Militia, Claude Thomas Pierre Batoire, um, along with the others um, who would be my supplementals. And that was during, I believe, Spanish America. How did you find out that he actually, or these patriots, specifically specifically Claude Thomas Pierre Matoire, how did you find out that he actually contributed to the American Revolution and thus you could apply for the Daughters of the American Revolution? I received a phone call from the cousin. How did I connect with her? Well, she works for the church down in Natchitoches. And so they, they are the ones that have access to baptismal records, etc. One particular day I called and I spoke to a cousin. And I told her, hey, my name is Bianca Alexander and I'm doing some research on my grandmother's heritage. My grandmother is still alive, but I have no birth record for her. Well, the woman never followed through. This particular Matoire cousin, distant cousin, never followed through. So I ended up calling the other church. And the other church that I, that I called happened to be St. John the Baptist. And when I called St. John the Baptist, and, you know, I told her what I was looking for. She said, you're related to me. And so I guess she took interest in supporting me and getting the information that I needed. And so that's how I found out. Later on in another conversation, she called me and said, Bianca, I know we've spoken a couple of times and you've been curious to know more about this Claude Thomas Pierre Matoire and Marie Therese Coin Coin. And I know you also mentioned something about DAR and wanting to join. You might be able to join through Claude Thomas Pierre Matoire. There's a woman I want you to reach out to. Her name is Peggy Acock. And so when she, Peggy Acock, decided to organize a chapter that represented the Isle Breville Cane River community, she had reached out to a lot of the Creole families. The next thing you know, they started the process of helping me to get my paperwork done to, to join DAR under the Patriot Claude Thomas Pierre Matoire. So how do you feel about your Revolutionary War ancestor, Claude Thomas Pierre Matoire, considering all of the history that comes with descending from a man that was French that came over and married Marie Therese, who was a former slave, and then them holding other slaves. But you, you talked about for the purpose of protecting those potential family members or other slaves so they wouldn't be bought by other people. But how do you feel about that lineage, that history, and him representing you and your lineage? I think it's interesting because I feel like I have something in common with him. I never knew I was going to become a French teacher or study at the University of Akron to become a French teacher. My grandmother spoke French growing up because her parents spoke French and, her, and, and their parents spoke French. So that was passed down to these Creole families. So for my grandmother to speak French all the way up through the time that she passed away, January of 2020 this year, that's amazing. 
So I said, wow, I became a French teacher. In addition to that, I said, wow, I'm a member of DAR, but how else am I possibly connected to him? Well, the mere fact that this man had a business mind, I imagine he was a analytical, logical thinker. There are times where I have to problem solve and think on my feet and I have to think about what's in the best interest of myself, but also in the best interest of people who are my subordinates, people who work for me as teachers, bus drivers, janitors, IT technicians. Um, I also have to think about what is in the best interest of these children who are under my care, you know, for eight hours. I feel like he was a leader, Claude Thomas Pierre Matoire. I feel like I'm a leader. The part that I still wrestle with at times about being a DAR member and knowing the history of DAR and then also the history of this Frenchman and other Frenchmen that I descend from who are also patriots. I don't understand why they didn't fight against slavery. I mean, I understand prior to the Civil War, you needed people to work the land. But why not have your white descendants or relatives work the land? I'm not saying they didn't. Why do you have to have a slave? Why do we have to have indentured servants where you always have the haves and the have nots? You're, the poor will always be with you, right? We get that from the good book. I imagine that when we think of the word slavery, we've heard about many horror stories that have occurred on plantations. Clearly, it wasn't all horrible in the situation between Marie Therese Coin Coin and Claude Thomas Pierre Matoire. I can't say that I have any oral history that says that somebody was raped. That doesn't mean it didn't happen, but I can't say that someone was beat or whipped. I just know that the very negative narrative that I've heard, that I've seen in Eyes on the Prize, possibly did not happen generation and generation in the slave history that I have in my family. It bothers me because I want to know, how did you treat your slaves? Did you fall in love with Marie Therese Coin Coin? Did some of the other Frenchmen who were your business partners treat their slaves poorly? Why did you all have these children with these women of color who descend from Africa? So I hope that someday I can find diaries so I can answer the very question that you're asking. But right now it is still a mystery. How do you reconcile that Claude Thomas Pierre Matoire fought in the American Revolution which brought a lot of pain to the Creole community because prior to the establishment of the United States, prior to the arrival of Anglo-Americans, when they were under French and Spanish rule in Louisiana, the Creole communities enjoyed really not having that same level of color lines that the Anglo-Americans enforced upon them. It was okay to be interracial and they were able to live together with all of these different races from Native American and African, Haitian and German and French and Spanish. So how do you reconcile that he fought for a cause which brought in this Anglo-American control over the Creoles and pretty much decimated their culture? I resolve it in my mind because I know he had no control. I know he had no control. When I think about the transatlantic slave trade, the French didn't fare well once we won the Revolutionary War. They didn't have the same influence any longer because yes, the Creole people, these mixed race people were able to flourish and kind of be in their own isolated community, very similar to the Navajo nation that I work with today honestly untouched in many ways by the outside world and because he probably didn't have that foresight to know that eventually after having had all of these mixed race children that now they're going to have to fight for their freedom. They're going to have to fight to own and keep their land. They're going to have to fight to be accepted in society. He just simply did not have the foresight to know that. Why did you want to even join the Daughters of the American Revolution? I felt like I wanted my grandmother's legacy to be preserved. I felt like she's been rejected by some family members. 
She's also been rejected by whites. She's been rejected by some blacks because of how fair she is. And obviously we've seen how it's hard for some people of color to see black men to take up and marry women who are non-black. Uh, you know, I said to myself, wouldn't it be great if I could fix it so that my grandmother's legacy, her son, her son, my father, wouldn't it be beautiful if I can make it a permanent piece of history in Washington, D.C. to preserve her Kuti heritage, her French, African, Native American history in the, you know, archives of DAR. If I could become a member, that solidifies that my grandmother is more American than apple pie and the bald eagle, that she is truly American. She's not African. She's not white. She's not black, but she is an American. She is a woman of color who has Creole heritage. I said, how beautiful that would be, because I can only imagine how hard it would be to leave all of your siblings to move to another state. You've never lived in any other state, but you moved to another state with your two uncles who made sure you were okay. And once you ended up having children and starting your own family, you were on your own. That had to have been hard for her. Having children with other men who didn't marry her and the person who did decide to live in a common law marriage with her decided to raise her son by another man and embrace him as his own child and even leave all his business affairs to this non-biological child was so amazing to me and I said not only am I going to honor my grandmother Lucille or Lucy Cuti in that way I'm going to honor the man who fell in love with this woman from Louisiana and took care of her son Ricky Cuti Alexander was amazing I said, I'm going to protect my grandmother's name. I'm going to honor her name where it might have been shunned because of maybe some decisions that she has made. Do you feel any differently about yourself knowing that you descend from someone who fought for the independence of this nation? Yes, I do. So when I hear people make comments out of ignorance saying, you know, black people need to get off welfare. The first comment that I want to say is, well, guess what? There are other ethnicities here in the United States of America that take advantage of the benefits of being on public assistance. So it's not just black people who are on welfare. When I hear people see, uh, see um, movies and things on TV showing black people in a not so positive light, like New Jack City and seeing Wesley Snipes being a big time drug dealer, seeing um, black people in roles where maybe they were involved in theft or carjacking. I say to myself, that does not represent my family. So for me, being a woman of color, that's how I identify, who embraces the fact that I have African ancestry. I have quite a bit of Native American ancestry by way of the Caddo Nation that I know of. I also have European ancestry, not just French, German, English, Spanish, etc. I am American before I am anything, but even before I'm American, I'm a Christian. Those Christian values that I have that are Catholic, that are Baptist from my mother's side of the family. I am one that truly believes that faith is what has made me to do the impossible in my family and in my life, to be able to persevere and get through many of the obstacles and challenges I've had in life. It is through my faith that allowed me to step out of the box and do something that was unpopular. Even my sorority sisters, even family members said, why did you join DAR? What do you get out of that? What does it do for you? Do you know that organization didn't always want blacks to join? And I'm thinking, well, how do you know that? Well, I mean, you can Google the history of uh, the beautiful uh, organization that I'm a part of. DAR is a beautiful organization, but it does have somewhat of a troubled history as it relates to um, people of color joining or even acknowledging people of color. Most black women in the Daughters of the American Revolution 
only have their immediate family family members if they have other people that descend from the same patriot. So for example, they would tell their mother or I should say close cousins, hey, come join, I've joined. So they take the lead and then they bring other family members in with them. So they very much know all of the people that descend from their patriot because they brought them in as far as the other black members are concerned. Your situation is quite unique. You have a lot of other black women or women of color that descend from a matoire. So there are probably thousands. I'm talking aunties, Moran, Lecomte, Monette, Rachel, Bossier, all of these French last names that these people of color have, whether they identify as black or European, all of us are scattered across the United States and all over the world who are people of color. We're not even including the whites who are descendants of Claude Thomas Pierre Matoire. He was securing his legacy by marrying that Brewart woman, but he was also not even knowing that he would have a lasting legacy in the black community, Hispanic community, American Indian community, and the Asian community, because there are several Creoles who have married Filipinos who are down in Louisiana now. He has solidified his legacy by having these these children. So I, I'm, I'm fascinated by it. But not all of the Matoire's descendants identify as black, correct? Isn't that interesting? Yeah. I guess you're in the same organization with other people who descend from the same mixed race heritage, but are deciding to identify other than black. Correct. The one drop rule didn't disappear just because someone married a white person and then their offspring married non-black people. It still exists. That one drop, all you do is take that DNA test or you have a baby and the child comes out (laughs) with these features that look very different from the Eurocentric features and there you have it. So being American really has nothing to do with race. It has nothing to do with race. It has to do with where you were born. Right. Because is it fair for us to even make someone or try to play someone who is Creole, who resents identifying and never did identify culturally from their heritage as a specific race? Their culture was Creole and that was it. And that's how they define themselves. So is it even our place to say that this person that is joining the organization, if whether they're black or white, because they're neither, correct? They're really They're Creole. really American. And these labels were not created by you and I or anyone else. This was created by the system that's in place that makes America what it is. So why did you decide to identify as black? I think when I look at the faces and I reflect on the faces of all the children I've ever worked with in the inner city schools that I've worked in here in the U.S., when I had a chance to see what they call black African Arabs who are Saudi, who dis- who descend from uh, other Arabs, Arabs who are wealthy, I said, whoa, I thought all Arabs looked a certain way. No, you have people whose skin complexion are darker than yourself and mine who are descendants from the king of Saudi Arabia for generations. I said, wow, I never thought that these people and Kuwaitis at that. I said, wow, how ignorant I was. I just assumed that people look a certain way. I was doing the same thing that people do every day here in America. So when I saw the the students that I've worked with over the course of my career and how they were marginalized, they were put in special ed, they were told, yeah, some students told me, I was told I can't do anything. You know, I'm not going to be able to go to college because I don't have the money or because of my behavior, some choices that I made, I wouldn't be successful. I said, well, you know what? I had a teacher once in grade school that said something to me similar. So when I think of black males and I think of the narrative in American history, my heart deep down inside emotionally hurts to see how black men, even some other men of color, how they've had to fight just to get a little 
a little piece of what we call the American dream. And I said, those are the people that I identify the most with, the underdogs, those that have had to work, pull themselves up by their bootstraps to be successful, to have something to say that, hey, I have a right to be here. Why did you decide to join the Cane River chapter, which is affiliated with your heritage from your grandmother, but not necessarily where you have lived or are living now. You grew up in Ohio. You live in New Mexico. You have been a member for less than a year now. So you're currently living in, in like I said, in New Mexico. So why did you choose to join a Louisiana chapter since you've never lived in Louisiana? The reason why I decided to join the Cane River chapter in particular is because, again, that's yet another extension of my grandmother's legacy. That's another tie to my blood roots. As I tell people all the time, May Racine, my roots run deep, run deep in the heart of Louisiana. And now I have been asked to actually become an associate member of the chapter in Cleveland. And I probably will also, once I find out what the rules are within DAR, if I can become associate, an associate member out here in New Mexico eventually, DAR is still growing. And no matter how many women of color join, we still have to break down those barriers. Because when they hear about the Cane River chapter, when they hear about how our President General, she embraces, she embraces, President General Van Buren embraces diversity. Let me tell you, DAR and many chapters will die out if we don't diversify and embrace the unique legacy that comes from all of our members and potential members who may not be white, who may not identify as white. It was icing on the cake to finally see the person face to face. Although it was online, I had been looking for this Risha Rainey because I want to know if there are any other black members I wasn't really satisfied when I joined DAR because it's like now I'm a member but how do I relate to some of my other distant cousins who don't identify as black but they're members of DAR and then how do I connect with other women of color like when I googled black women in DAR I happened to find a small snippet and I got a chance to actually take a look at the screen and see this Risha Rainey and I wonder what does she look like and is she <laughs> educated and yeah she must be educated if she's a member of DAR uh, these yeah. these these non women of color are not going to just want anybody to be a part of their organization oh, and when I saw your accomplishments and I saw who you were and how you hold your head up and you're smiling I saw someone that's very happy I saw someone that has joy that has life someone that I can identify with that has accomplished something that can say, hey, I'm not just some other woman on the street. No, I am somebody that you need to get to know. And that inspired me to say, hey, but there are chapters that have women of color who are very similar to me in many different ways and who embrace their American heritage, who are not ashamed of the fact that they may come from unique patriots. It's okay that black history for me is not always pleasant, but there is always a silver lining. And it is nice to know that there are other black women that went on the same journey as me and they are connected to patriots that are part of the American Revolution. Mm -hmm. 